The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Well, greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show. Believe it or not, episode 47 tonight. We're glad you're with us. Remember, every single episode is on YouTube and also on every podcast platform under the sun. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Audible. We are everywhere. We also want you to visit our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. And if you have a question for the panel, please submit it through email. Hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's meet our panel and our special guest tonight. We'll get the show going. From California, regular panel member, Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Hello, Paul, and hello, team. And welcome, Dr. Cole, to our new session with you today. All right. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Eicher. The gentleman who started this show had the grand vision to begin with and put it all together. He's also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. They make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000. From New Jersey, physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chubak. Hello, Dr. Chubak. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm doing fine. Thanks very much. Looking forward to a great episode tonight and a long-awaited guest and a uh, very, very talented uh, person that we have with us tonight. And I think I'm going to run right into our introduction with no further ado. I want to introduce to everybody Dr. Wendy Cole. Dr. Cole is a podiatrist, and I know her uh, mostly through an introduction made by our dear friend, Dr. Mark Moline. Uh, Mark, as everybody knows, was at one time a co-host on our program, but has some professional responsibilities that now keep him from doing that. His time is highly restricted and constrained, but we miss him dearly, and we're certainly very, very appreciative that he has um, made this introduction. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Cole. She has been passionately advocating for medical and technological advances in wound care for uh, roughly two decades. And she's an active educator and an extremely, extremely active uh, speaker. I know that because uh, we're connected on LinkedIn. And through LinkedIn, I get to see her many invitations for speaking all over the country and all over the world, quite frankly. And she's had numerous accolades, including uh, numerous articles published in uh, very prestigious journals, including Wound Management and Prevention, Podiatry Today, The Foot Journal, Wound Masterclass, Podiatry Management, and our dear friend Rich Dubin's publication, Lower Extremity Review. Um, Wendy's involved in the biotech industry, and uh, through that, she's won a lot of her recognition for research and leadership, and she sits on several emerging biotech company advisory boards. Um, that are looking at innovative research protocols, which everybody knows I'm very much interested, Dr. Eicher is very much interested in, and of course, Dr. Glavitsky, who couldn't be with us this evening, is heavily interested. So with that brief introduction, I could go on and on because she has a very extensive resume and CV. Welcome, Dr. Wendy Cole. Thank you. And yes, this has been a long overdue uh, get together, if you will. So I'm excited to be part of the podcast tonight, and I appreciate the invitation. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to see if our colleague and esteemed co-host, Dr. Eicher. Dr. Eicher, would you like to start with an opening question for Dr. Cole or discussion point, not necessarily a question? I wish you would have been with me just a few hours ago when I had my new patient. This wonderful new man, 75-year-old man, came with a lower extremity swelling, uh, difficulty with ambulation. Um, yes, he was overweight, but he told me he saw so many doctors and they told, told him, there's nothing we can do for you. 
So when I undress him, and I wish that I can put the limb, the ultrasound study on it, it was clear lymphedema with so much fluid trapped in the subcutaneous tissue that it it it, it breaks my heart to see patients like that. Uh, low extremity with profound swelling extending to the ankles, of course, ankles, dorsum of the feet, and toes were like little square boxes. Mm. He cannot wear regular shoes because he cannot enter to the shoes. And of, his skin looked a little bit like an elephant skin. And again, he was told by numerous physicians, well, there is not much we can do for you. And there is no no treatment for you. Uh, exercise and lose weight. Well, typical uh, respond from the patient, I can exercise. I can hardly get out of my bed because I cannot walk. I cannot enter the shoe to the shoes that I used to wear. Well, eat less. And when I see patients like that, I thought, oh my gosh. So anyhow, I sent him to podiatrist. I told him how to uh, change the diet with a lymphedema, lipidema, nutrition guide, uh, a book that I'm co-author of, of this. And I guided him, number one, with nutrition, number two, with skin care. And number three, he had such a fungal toenails. Have you seen anybody? Yes, but they told me there is not much I can do about this. And I wish that I would have been there with you, Dr. Cole, so you can grab my hand and his hand, the patient's hand, and guide him because there is hope. There is a treatment. And these people, and he's only 75 and young 75, they need help and they need treatment and not today, but decades ago. So I think we we need to work together to educate physicians that lymphedema is a disease and needs to be treated immediately at early onset and guide the patient, not only looking at the legs, not only looking at the nails and so on, but guide the patient so the patient does not have to end up like the one that I just saw. No, I agree. And I see it all the time in my clinical practice. When I was practicing podiatry uh, the past dozen years or so, I've been focused on wound care and wound management. But even those patients come in uh, with lower extremity wounds and undiagnosed venous insufficiency and lymphedema. And, you know, they see their primary care doctor or their internist on a regular basis uh, who is supposed to be evaluating the, the patient. Uh, they complain of swelling and, and, like you said, limited function and maybe inability to wear appropriate shoe gear. But yet, you know, they're kind of turned a blind eye to, to these complaints on this patient. And they continue to suffer. Um, and it, it is this vicious cycle. As you mentioned, the patient is told to exercise and lose weight, but they can't barely walk. They have limited function. They can't have, you know, a good supportive shoe to do the exercise with. And then the condition continues to get worse. And then unfortunately, as you mentioned, we see some skin changes some trophic changes. We get that thickening of the skin. Sometimes it can look like an elephant hide uh, changes, you know, color changes and then sclerosis and, and skin breakdown. And that's usually where I see the patient, right? Once they've gotten to this tipping point and they've not been diagnosed, they've not been managed correctly and the skin breaks down and now they have of a, a very difficult to heal wound, which oftentimes becomes infected and then they are sent to wound care. Uh, and now as a wound care clinician, we sort of need to backpedal and we have to start from the beginning and we have to control all of these pathologic things that are going on with the patient, their comorbidities, uh, you know, deal with all of the internal factors that are off uh, that help to support wound healing in order to even get this wound to have a chance to heal and get the patient hopefully back to their activities of daily living and increase their functionality. So it, it's it's sad that that story happens more often than we'd like to hear it. Absolutely. And for patients like this, uh, Dr. Cole, are you routinely sending them for venous ultrasound, arterial uh, lower extremity, arterial scan, 
Uh, what blood work do you typically recommend in terms of looking at uh, glucose levels, A1Cs, and so on? Yeah, so a lot of the patients that we see um, do have primary care physicians, and we hope that primary care physicians are, you know, monitoring their A1C and for folks that aren't diabetic, the A1C gives us a good snapshot in, in patients that are diabetic of, of how that glucose is being managed. So unfortunately, um, taking the patient's word for it <laughs> doesn't always translate into what's really going on. So the A1C is a really good blood test to, to let the clinician know in our diabetic patients how well their diabetes is managed. So um, if I can't find a, a, a reasonably, you know, reasonable recent A1C, uh, I'll definitely take the patient, I'll get the patient's A1C to see how their blood sugar is being managed if they're diabetic. Um, if they have lower extremity swelling and, and really and truly every, every single new wound with a new patient with a lower extremity wound that walks in my doors gets at least non-invasive vascular studies. So uh, there are studies that we perform either in the clinic or in the vascular lab where uh, they put blood pressure cuffs up and down patients' legs and on their arm. So it gives us an idea of what the blood flow is into the leg and into and around the ankle and even into the foot. So additionally, if we see the swelling, which apparently this patient had significant swelling, then we'll go ahead and get some venous studies too to see if we have something happening called reflux. So in the venous system, uh, it, it, it should be a one-way street. We should have the blood pumping from the superficial venous system or the veins, the superficial veins closest to the skin. They should pump through to the deep venous system through a series of perforating veins. And these there's valves in the veins that are supposed to prevent this backflow. But unfortunately, when patients have disease states, it can contribute to what we call venous insufficiency and venous reflux. And so what we'll see is instead of it just go, the blood flow just going one way from the superficial into the deep system, we'll see this backflow reflux or regurgitation. And what will occur is since this backflow will be happening in the patient, we'll see a backup in the flow and we'll see leaking into the tissues causing the swelling. So we often send those folks to get some vascular testing to see if they have this venous insufficiency, if they have this reflux. Sometimes that can be managed medically. Sometimes it can be managed surgically. Um, so it gives a variety of options of how to best manage patients. Exactly, exactly. And a patient like the one that uh, Emily is uh, describing, we've all seen, those of us who've been in clinical practice for a long time, with this, you know, very, very severe, as you say, trophic changes and thickening of the skin, which can be very scale-like, and as, as it's been described here tonight, like an elephant hide or sometimes even rep like a reptilian kind of uh situation with scaling and thick calluses and so forth. And so as a vascular surgeon, I can tell you, even from my point of view, with a lot of experience, in some cases, checking pedal pulses in those patients can be a real challenge because the skin is so thickened uh, mm -hmm. so that pulse examination can be very unreliable. And um, as you said, sometimes things like ankle brachial index and uh, toe index and so on and so forth can be helpful. But again, challenging, especially when you have somebody with this kind of severe chronic skin change and then ultrasonography, uh, what we call sonogram testing or ultrasound testing of the lower um, arterial and venous systems can be helpful, especially in a diabetic for the arterial or if patients have other risk factors like smoking and obesity and family history. And if they have, as you said, an open wound um, in the face of diabetes. So we physicians want to be looking at all of these possibilities based on the clinical signs. Is this primary lymphedema? Is it secondary lymphedema? Is it phlebolymphedema? Is it phlebolympholipidema? Is there an element of diabetic disease? 
associated with the arterial side of the function, et cetera. And that brings us to some really interesting topics that Dr. Cole has expertise in. And one of those that I want to ask her about when we talk about diabetics and glucose monitoring, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about glucose toxicity and how this can affect especially the endothelial tissues, the lining of the vessels. So in diabetes, we know that patients have hyperglycemia, right? So it, depending on the type of diabetes you have, there's various reasons why you develop hyperglycemia, but increased blue, blood glucose, right? And unfortunately, if we don't manage that increase in blood glucose, and medically manage it and manage it well, um, we'll see something develop called glucose toxicity. And high levels of sustained glucose will be an irritant to the tissues in the body. Primarily, we can see it in, in three regions. We can see it in the eye, and oftentimes diabetics will develop retinopathy, so they'll get limited uh, vision or dysfunction in their vision because uh, the vessels in the eye are very friable and susceptible to this glucose toxicity. We also will see it in the kidneys. So unfortunately, over time, if the glucose is not managed properly, the glucose toxicity will cause uh, disease of the kidney. And that's why many of our diabetic patients end up on dialysis. And thirdly, we see in the lower extremity, and you can see it in the upper extremity too, in, in the hands and the feet. But again, being a podiatrist, uh, you know, my, my area of expertise is the foot. But the smallest nerves tend to be obviously in the digits, uh, the hands and the feet. And glucose toxicity can also be seen in uh, the nervous tissue. And it will cause a dysfunction of the nerves that we often call diabetic neuropathy. So it can lead to a couple of things. It can lead to the patients having no sensation. And I'll tell you, I've seen patients walk down blacktop driveways in the middle of summertime. I've seen them step on a variety of objects. I've seen them wear poor fitting shoes and they have injury to their feet. And because they have this neuropathy or this nerve dysfunction, they're not even aware that any of this damage has happened until they, you know, see blood on their sock or, you know, discharge on their sock or someone tells them, hey, your foot's bleeding. Or maybe they even smell an odor because they've developed an infection because of the injury. Um, the other things that can happen in the foot is that you can also get motor neuropathy. So not only are the small nerves that you can feel the sensations with uh, damaged, the small nerves that innervate the muscles that allow the foot to function properly and to keep the structural support of the foot, those can be damaged. So patients with diabetes and nerve dysfunction, glucose toxicity, can also have structural issues and develop bunions and hammer toes or claw toes. And these are areas that can be uh, pressure points and can rub on shoes and can cause them to have difficulties finding shoes that fit and can also lead to difficulty with ambulation. And then thirdly, there's an autonomic nervous system. So those nerves can also be non-functioning. And what the autonomic nervous system does is it helps with uh, hydration to the skin. So it helps with sweating. So it keeps our skin hydrated. So a lot of our diabetics will have dry, scaly skin because they don't have that hydration that's occurring. And then it can also affect the small blood vessels in the foot. So it could cause dilation or it can cause closing of the small vessels. And that can contribute to lack of blood flow into the foot. Uh, even if like we talked about, those screening tests are normal. So into the leg and into the ankle, we have good blood flow. Those small little vessels can be non-functioning because of glucose toxicity and neuropathy that develops. And therefore they have functional ischemia in their foot, which means even though they have blood flow going to the foot, technically, 
the l small little blood vessels aren't working properly. So they're not perfusing the tissues. And that can lead to a whole host of problems, uh, not only contribute to injury of the tissue, but then if the tissues are injured, if you develop an ulcer or a blister or cut in the skin, then you don't have the ability to heal it as well as someone without diabetes and without these problems. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. We know that the the increased blood sugar levels that you referred to that we call hyperglycemia can also lead to significant problems with immunity, white blood cell um, function uh, problems that are important for um, fighting infection. The white blood cells are those, those little uh, soldier cells that go out and kill all of the kill all of the uh, little bacteria and funguses and and all of the invading invading microorganisms so so diabetes has so many so many ramifications and you you went through such a beautiful review of all of that um, one of the things that um, I didn't hear you mention but I'd love to get your thoughts as a podiatrist specifically what we call shark foot can you talk to us about that a little bit well, Charcot foot is tied into that autonomic neuropathy that we talked about. And because uh, when you have the glucose toxicity, you know, high levels of blood sugar over a period of time, glucose toxicity, the body doesn't have a way to regulate that blood flow into the foot. And so what we can see is we can have an increase in the blood and sort of wash out the bone, if that makes sense. So you'll get issues with the bone breaking down and then also that neuropathy that sensory neuropathy we talked about contributes to that so patients will typically have a precipitating event so they'll have an injury and oftentimes it's not a huge injury it's not like you know they fell off a ladder or they fell off a step it could be something as minor as you know hitting their foot on uh, the dishwasher door which happens all the time or a screen door or, or their dog steps on their foot so they have a precipitating event which then will lead to some damage and inflammation it should lead to vasodilation of the blood to bring you know healing factors down there but what will happen is it, it almost uh gets out of control there's no regulation because of that glucose toxicity and that functional or dysfunction in the uh, vessels of the foot so they'll wash out the bone and they'll have all these minor fractures that occur and we see this happen oftentimes where the foot will kind of bottom out and patients will develop something called a rocker bottom foot so in the midfoot joint, we see a lot of this damage occur and the foot will collapse and you'll get a rocker bottom appearance of the foot. And over time, what will happen is that is an area of pressure and many of these patients will have difficulty getting proper shoes, offloading the area, distributing the pressure, that area will break down and they'll develop ulcers. That's, that's that's a beautiful review. You know, I think that's why for the patients out there, anybody who may be um, experiencing a wound, a chronic wound, a new wound, and if you haven't been in the hands of a good physician who has experience, it's it's so important that you see somebody who is a wound specialist that like Dr. Cole. And fortunately, around the United States now, we have so many good wound centers that typically have a variety of doctors working in them, sometimes podiatrists, sometimes general surgeons, sometimes vascular surgeons, and and many other types of, of physicians who are now involved in wound care, plastic surgeons and um, primary care Dr. physicians. John Washington, MD. Many, many people have become yeah. interested in, in wound care, but it it's important to be seen by somebody who has a lot of experience because just by examining you, um, they can they can make a lot of um, educated decisions about what tests you need and what might be going on. It's what we call a differential diagnosis, and it's based on it's based on 
primarily a good physical examination and a history. So someone like Dr. Cole can look at your foot and see, oh, she, this patient has a wound at the tip of their big toe. That's going to tell her one thing. This patient may have a wound on the sole of the foot under the ball of the foot and is a diabetic. That's going to tell her something else. This patient has a wound on the inside of the ankle or the outside of the ankle. So each one of these things may point to diabetic change, Charcot foot, pressure ulceration, ischemic foot, meaning not enough blood flow to the foot, venous insufficiency problem, even what we call an embolic problem where we have blue toe syndrome, where a small piece of calcium can break off from an artery upstream and get lodged in the tip of a toe. So with all of this amazing technology we have today, ultrasounds and CAT scans and MRIs and bone scans and you name it, scans, we have a million scans, but there's still no substitute, not yet, despite artificial intelligence and everything else, for a really, really good doctor who's experienced and well-trained like Dr. Cole. So it's a beautiful, beautiful review. Um, Emily, are you with us? Yes, I am. And it yep. was a fantastic review. I, I wish I can see you. Uh, um, well, actually, I see you. You don't see me. <laughs> I will check the computer tomorrow. But thank you so much. This was such a detailed review of everything and really what needs to be done. And this patient that I mentioned before, uh, he told me that he was mentioned that he's borderline diabetic. So again, um, believe it or not, I am in Santa Monica. He took the train from Sacramento to see me. I mean, it's a fantastic patient. Uh, he is looking for a help. Mm -hmm. And I think we need more of Dr. Cole around uh, the United States to diagnose these patients properly and also to guide them. Because, yes, indeed, there is a treatment for everything. Yeah, you know, I would, we I would also... I would also jump in there, Emily, to say that I think one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Cole mentioned also indicates what a good doctor she is. We don't want to be focused, and for the patients out there, know this. Don't let your wound be the only focus of your medical care. That wound can be an indicator that many other things are going on. And she mentioned retinopathy in the eye. She mentioned uh, nephropathy in the kidney. Again, as a as a uh, old cardiac surgeon who did a lot of triple bypasses and quadruple bypasses, coronary artery disease might be the most life threatening problem that you have. If you have a wound in the foot, it could be an indicator that your diabetes, high blood pressure, history of smoking, family history, obesity, et cetera, et cetera may have caused blockages in the heart that could be life-threatening. So we want to make sure that you're going to a doctor who is seeing you as a whole person, a human being, and not just a foot ulcer, a toe ulcer, et cetera, et cetera. They, they need to be working with your primary medical team, your primary care doctor, as she mentioned very appropriately. So looking at all your blood work, looking at all of your organ systems that you're kidneys are functioning well, your heart is functioning well, the arteries in your neck are open, a, a full, full, comprehensive review of all your problems. The, the, the wound is, is in many ways an insight into so many things that could be going on in your body. As, as a good ophthalmologist will tell you, I can look in your eye and tell you so much about all of your health problems. The same as with a wound, that wound gives us so many clues. I want to ask another question or open another topic because I find this so, so interesting. Um, you are working on some new thinking, it seems, regarding, now I'm a cardiovascular surgeon specializing in venous and lymphatic disease for many years. So this I can tell you is kind of at the cutting edge of thinking. How do you see what are you learning about the relationship between diabetes and venous disease? The link between diabetes and arterial disease has long been understood and accepted. What should we know about diabetes and venous disease? Well, more and more we're learning and we're seeing, just like the patient that Dr. Eicher has mentioned, that there are many things going on 
in these patients at the same time. And as you point out, our, our physical exam and understanding the patient as an individual is, is so important. And through this thought process, in my practice, I was seeing a lot of patients for diabetic foot ulcers, but lo and behold, they also had a lot of edema. And when I focused on the edema or the swelling in the tissues, not only offloading, not only managing their glucose levels, their blood sugars, but also working with ways to manage the swelling through compression and other, other things, um, the rate of wound healing was so much greater. So I started to kind of dive into this topic, you know, what's the link here with these patients with their venous flow, as you mentioned, we know that they have some arterial issues. Uh, we can get hardening of the arteries for patients with diabetes. And we talked about that limited perfusion or that functional ischemia with diabetes because of the neuropathy. But also that increase in blood glucose, that glucose toxicity can also affect the venous uh, system as well. And so there are there's evidence in the literature that shows that that glucose toxicity will cause dysfunction of the endothelial tissue, so the blood vessels themselves. Uh, too bad Dr. Moline isn't with us because I'm going to say a word he loves to say is the glycocalyx, right? That's so right. <laughs> the glycocalyx, which is, is part of the lining of the wall, the small vessels, the small veins, uh, will be damaged. It will become thin and it will lead to leakiness of the vessels. So that leakiness and if we superimpose some venous insufficiency, like we talked about, that the blood flow is going the wrong way, that it's being pumped into the superficial venous system, then those veins are leaky, then we're getting a lot of this fluid into the interstitial space or into the tissues. And so what that will do is it will cause a diffusion constraint. So what happens in the microvascular system of, of patients is that that's where the exchange of nutrients, cells that we need to either keep our tissues healthy or, or, or help to repair tissues or fight off infection and all the nutrients, that's how that exchange happens in the small blood vessels. If we're getting all this leakiness of fluid in that area, it will cause a diffusion constraint. So that important process of this exchange of nutrients and oxygen and cells won't occur. And so skin breakdown will occur. So ulcers can develop, but then also ulcer healing won't be happening in, in an expedited manner. And so by causing a change in the hemodynamics by applying some sort of compression bandage or compression garment and allowing for some repair of that reflux. So making that fluid go the right way through the venous system and then impairing that leakiness that will help to support wound healing. And so kind of developed a, a updated algorithm of care for diabetic foot ulcers because we, we, as physicians know, we need to offload diabetic foot ulcers. We have to manage them for infection. We have to manage the, the drainage. Um, but we don't talk about adding compression therapy to these folks. And I think that's uh, a, a piece of the puzzle that we've been missing. And I'm advocating for patients that can be compressed if they have good blood flow, good arterial flow into the foot and into the leg. And that we should use some sort of compression dressing to help to support the venous system and prevent that that leakiness, if you will, into the tissues and uh, try to normalize at least another one of the parameters uh, that could be faulty and leading to these hard to heal wounds and, and difficult to heal wounds. And I, and it's it's really made a huge difference in my patients. Yeah, I think I think that's a fascinating discussion, and uh, you know, I have a couple of thoughts, and I want to I want to get one thought from Emily too at the end of that. Um, the one thing that I think our physician listeners who may not be have that much experience or expertise in this area, and our patients, 
our body is obviously quite a miraculous, uh, magnificent uh, machine, so to speak. Um, and this interaction between basically four systems cannot be overstated. The arterial system, the venous system, the lymphatic system, and the immune system. These, these four systems are working on a microvascular or microscopic level in just a magnificent dance where the arteries are bringing nutrients and oxygenated blood to the tissues. The veins are responsible for taking the deoxygenated blood and waste products out of the tissues. The little bit of leakage, normal leakage of fluid that occurs should be picked up by what I consider a sump pump system of the lymphatic system, taking away the extra fluid and cells and, and debris, and then decontaminating that material as it goes through the system of, of lymph nodes, which are part of the immune system. And so we have these these beautiful systems of veins, arteries, lymph vessels, and lymph nodes working as circulation and nutrition and immunity. Um, and as Dr. Cole so, so beautifully pointed out, sometimes we have problems where we get increased, what we call capillary permeability, where the little tiny vessels allow too much fluid and other things to escape into the soft tissues, and that can cause problems. Some of that will be cellular material, but one of the things, and this is where I want to get Dr. Eicher's input, because I know she has great interest and expertise here. Emily, tell us what happens, or tell us the importance of proteins leaking into the soft tissues in patients with lymphedema. Well, this is an incredible topic. We can spend the whole day on this. But when, when the lymphatic system is not working well, uh, all the uh, everything moving anti-gravity from the distal, uh, talking about lower extremities, it, it should move through the lymph lymphangions when they open up to another segment to find finally to the lymph nodes. Now, if we have dilatation of the lymph vessels, what happens is all the fluid leaks into the subcutaneous tissue, interstitial tissue, and sits there, just like in this patient that I saw this morning. And gradually it accumulates more and more. And so the, the shape of the leg is changing. And then uh, also it's not only the ankle part, but foot and toes are changing into much greater size, uh, leading to inability of mobility or uh, disruption of mobility and not being able to enter the to regular shoes and subsequently not walking properly. And there is a balance problem and so on, so on. And this particular patient, again, the medical history is so important. And what is so very important that you already, Dr. Chubak mentioned, we are not going to be focusing only on the foot, only on the toes, only. We have to look at the entire body, one human being with the problems. And when I asked this patient, when did you first start to notice swelling in the foot? Well, only a few years ago. How about your toes? Oh, that was a long time ago. So most likely the patient has history of lymphatic insufficiency or primary lymphedema, maybe tardar or so. And lymphocentigraphy will point out, uh, lymphocentigraphy, which is a nuclear medicine study, will tell us the, the actually anatomy of the lymphatic system. So this was already happening over decades. And it could have been prevented to this extent that I saw this morning. So again, we have to see patients as one entity, one human being with other problems, and then we can address the other issues and problems. Um, frequently, what I see is the patients with similar patients like this, being on what sort of a water pill, Lasix, uh, for years. Well, doctor told me uh, if I take 20 milligrams of Lasix a day, it will help. Well, it didn't help, so then double the dose. And, and then 
and we see that frequently, even nowadays, even in young population of new physicians where they are treating swelling with water pill. And now without investigating why we have this problem, what is the etiology of the, uh, the swelling? So if the patient that I saw today started to have primary lymphedema uh, evidence, clinical evidence years ago, this was again masquerading into this point with inappropriate management, uh, poor diagnosis. And uh, Dr. Ruxon way back when wrote fantastic article, which states um, the title of that was medical ignorance. And I think we have to kind of go back and start looking at the pathology of the problem in one patient and address it early and start treating it early. And as Dr. Cole pointed out so eloquently in her speech, it's not, we have to look at everything. And uh, the patient has swollen legs. Most likely there is also element of diabetes. And so, and then we have to address that and treat everything. And compression, early onset of compression is very important. And in early onset, it's easier to apply the compression stocking. When somebody comes decades later, it's very difficult, impossible to put compression stocking. So we have to go step by step back and eliminate the most obvious problem, clean the skin, address the skin issue, and start from step one. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. I want to I want to just pick up on one thought there that I try to bring up as much as I can during the during these programs for our primary care doctors for our listeners I talk to my patients about this every day the skin the skin the skin the skin please everybody remember the skin is not just a pretty covering of our body it's not like a coat or or a shirt or a leather jacket it is the largest organ in the human body. That's why there is a field of medicine <laughs> dedicated to it called dermatology. And unfortunately, I say this with all due respect to all of my colleagues, because I certainly don't know nearly everything about medicine, nor can anybody know everything about medicine. I'm disappointed frequently how, I should just say frequently, I see that dermatologists are not putting two and two together with these other disease processes. They know so much about skin cancers and so many important subjects and many, many important subjects. But somehow venous insufficiency, they're not always getting the education that they should, lymphedema, they're not getting the education that they should, and sometimes treating these things with steroid creams and or, or patients being dismissed by their primary care that just elevate your feet or take this water pill. So. Education for all of us, every single physician, is so important so that we have better under understanding. And I wanted to mention, pick up one other thing that I'm sure Dr. Cole will be sensitive to that Emily was touching on. With the, with the um, diuretics to our primary care doctors who are listening and so forth, please be very, very cautious for several reasons. When we dehydrate these patients who may already be diabetic, who may already have some underlying renal insufficiency, even preclinical renal insufficiency, uh, we do not want to 
dehydrate these patients that can lead to greater nephropathy. That's number one. Number two, in the lower extremity with lymphedema, where we know that protein is leaking out of the um, capillary system, out of the microvasculature, into the soft tissues, causing inflammation. If you then exacerbate that situation by dehydrating the soft tissue with severe extreme um, uh, diuresis, that protein concentration only becomes greater in the soft tissues, creating greater inflammation, scarring, and et cetera, et cetera, leading to ulcer formation and non-healing, et cetera, et cetera. So now we need to go back to our esteemed guests as we come near the end of our show. She's led to so many great discussions and, and, and um, interesting topics to go over. Um, Wendy, if I leave it to you to share something that you feel most important, something passionate about that you want to share, not only with our patient listeners, but also with our clinician listeners. Is there anything that comes to mind that you th that you feel that you really want to talk to us about? Well, I think we covered a lot of really important clinical pearls, right? And we can't reiterate enough about, you know, as you mentioned, treating the whole patient, not just the whole in the patient. And there are a lot of clues. I love that. Why, I love that. Yeah. Why that wound occurred, first off, and why is that wound not healing? And you're right. I tell my students that you your most important tool that you have in your toolbox is a complete patient history and a complete wound assessment. I love to play with gadgets. I love new technologies. I have fancy cameras and all sorts of different systems that I'm one of the first to uh, adopt because being a, in an academic institution and being a researcher, I get to play with all of these things, but none of them will take the place of that history and physical and every patient is different and there are barriers to wound healing both you know all the things we can see in the physical exam but also the social history and we can't uh, sidestep that right uh, do patients live alone do they live with someone what type of work do they do what kind of activity levels uh, do they have religious beliefs is there any uh, religious constraints or either you know lifestyle are they vegan are they you know opposed to certain products being used on them and, and really getting to know your patients Did they, do they smoke did they ever smoke yeah <laughs> which they drink or, or not when you say smoke too you know not just cigarettes people mm -hmm. smoke and vape and and you you have to really get to know patients and and dive down into what's going on in in their lives which will help us to be better doctors because oh, sure. if we could really decide treatment plans uh that are appropriate for individuals, not just, oh, they've got a diabetic foot ulcer. And I get asked that a lot. You know, I, I do a lot of consulting and they'll say, well, what's your treatment algorithm for a diabetic foot ulcer? I'm like, not every diabetic foot ulcer is the same. Not every venous leg ulcer. Of course, there's some underlying pathology that's occurring in these patients, but you have to practice individualized medicine. Oh, um, whoa, 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 radical. radical. <laughs> I know, I know. Radical. And I, I think that's a really important point. And I'd like that to hopefully be the take home message from this is to really understand it. I, that's why I love wound care. Um, I feel like I am a detective gathering clues from my patient to figure out like who did it, right? What are our, What's our usual suspect? And based on that, I could tailor a treatment plan to hopefully have that patient go on to rapid wound healing. But without all those pieces, if you don't collect all of that information with your investigation, you're not going to be successful. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to just echo a few things before we before we sign off. And as Emily said, we could go on for hours and hours and we could have you back week after week. It never it never gets old. But a few things, especially for our young physicians who are just coming into practice, not that some of our, our older colleagues don't wouldn't benefit from this, but they're probably a little bit tougher nut to crack. Don't forget why you became a physician. You have to care about people, right? Imagine that every patient were your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your child, you have to care. 
That's what we do. It's called health care. And in being in in being caring, we have to be curious. I wonder what caused this. I wonder why you have this. I wonder if there's some way I can make this better. I wonder what you've been eating. I wonder what you've been drinking. I wonder what you've been smoking. I wonder what your blood work would look like. I wonder what your blood pressure is. I'm curious about you. I want to learn all I can about you so that I can understand how you got in this situation, hopefully help you to, as Dr. Cole just said, heal heal rapidly and completely. Sometimes, you know, I have patients in my practice with venous ulcers that you practically don't have to provide any wound care. Once you take care of the underlying problem, what we call the etiology, the, the, the inciting problem, the wound heals itself. What a miracle, because here's the thing. We all, as physicians, we can get very kind of uh, full of ourselves, especially we surgeons and cardiovascular surgeons, right? We think that we're fixing everything. The body will heal itself, not mysteriously, not this isn't woo-woo stuff. This isn't, you know, with uh, crystals and, and uh, you know, sitting under a, a pyramid in the desert. This is with understanding science and putting things in place so the body has that that ability to do what it has evolved to do. One of the Examples I like to give an orthopedic surgeon back in the old days before all, you know, joint replacements and so forth. If you came with a broken femur or you came with a broken humerus, his or her job was mainly to align the broken bones and immobilize them, put a cast around it so that they didn't move. The rest, your body did. The body healed the bone. The body brought the calcium. The body created the, the, the callus. The body made 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 the bone one piece again and rigid and strong. The physician's job is to help the body to be in a position where it can do that. So if it means bringing more blood flow in an arterial patient and the wound heals, terrific. If it means re reversing the reverse flow in venous insufficiency and getting the blood going the right way to heal the venous ulcer, terrific. But you have to understand the patient and in order to understand the patient, you have to really care. And to show how much you care, you have to be curious, ask questions, think about it, and you have to spend time. And this idea of algorithms and protocols and what's your, you know, what's your diabetic foot ulcer protocol? Depends on who we're talking about, right? How old is he? How old is she? How much does she weigh? How big is the wound? It's called patient care. It's called being a doctor. It's called being a nurse. It's called being a therapist. Healthcare. You have to care. We go back on this show again and again and again to the basics. And I think that having Dr. Cole, a world-class expert with incredible experience, reinforcing that with us tonight just goes to show that even when you're at the very, very pinnacle of your career, and you're a world-renowned expert lecturing all over, doing research, writing, and so on and so forth, the fundamentals never change. If you want to be a great healthcare provider, doctor, nurse, uh, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, et cetera, et cetera, lymphedema therapist, I don't care what. It begins with caring. And I love that. I'm going to repeat, I'm going to repeat that line that she that she so beautifully shared. It's not just about treating the whole in the patient. It's about treating the whole patient. And Dr. And Dr. Moline introduced me a long time ago to the idea. I went through five years of general surgical residency, two years of cardiovascular. I never thought of patients with wound as, wounds as wounded patients, the wounded patient. But these people are wounded, and it's awful to live that way. And I'll finish my my thoughts with this, and I've said it before on the show, I've done a lot of amazing things as a physician. I've been blessed to have that opportunity. Heart transplants, total artificial hearts, pediatric heart surgery, kidney transplants. I've done incredible things. I don't know that there's anything more gratifying as a, as a physician and as a healthcare provider than seeing somebody with a chronic, long-standing wound heal. I mean, I just, it it, it gets me so excited and so happy and so re-energized about being a doctor every time I see somebody with a really long set, somebody who's been in the care of somebody else for a year and a half, two years, non-healing, you bring them in, you make the proper diagnosis, you you put together the right treatment plan, and they finally heal when they thought it was never going to happen. 
Very gratifying. Dr. Cole, do you want to give some final thoughts on that? No, I agree. And that's, you know, why wound healing is my passion and my mission, uh, because it is so gratifying and in dealing with and living with a chronic wound interrupts every aspect of our patients' lives. It causes them pain. They can't do their activities of daily living. They can't work. They can't do the exercise that they love that helps them to decrease stress. They sometimes can't be around their family because the wound drains so much. They have to do dressing changes. Maybe there's an odor um, so that they become depressed. They have sleep disturbances. Uh, There's a lot of uh, psychosocial, you know, things that occur within the patient. They have to monitor every meeting, everything in their schedule, their daily schedule that sort of revolves around the care of their wound. It can affect intimacy, their sex life, their their, their social life, so many things. Yeah. And and it's not just a wound, right? It's it's the patient's Mm -hmm. lives, every aspect. So you're right. If you can support the patient and you can help give them a good outcome in a timely manner, because some of these can go on for years, 15 years, 18 years, I've had patients. It's the most gratifying thing. So I agree with you. It's it's wonderful. Agreed. And I always say that was my last thing, but I'm going to say one more thing that I bring out on the show <laughs> again and again, because we are, we are, you know, we're broadcasting from the United States and we're blessed in that way. We have tremendous resources in this country. I want the patients to know if you had a wound for two years, five years, 15 years, don't give up. There's still help and there's still hope. And you may need a primary care doctor, a podiatrist, a vascular surgeon, a plastic surgeon, a nutritionist, a dietitian, a bariatric surgeon, an endocrinologist, uh, on and on and on. These are complicated problems that require, in some t- in some cases, huge teams of people to put their heads together and leave no stone unturned, whether it's nutrition, surgery, wound debridement, wound dressing, proper compression, proper unloading, proper diagnosis through, through physical examination or diagnostic testing. These are not easy problems, and I can tell you one of the big, big um, lies that is now, I think, dying, fortunately, was that historically wound care was somehow kind of at the bottom of the barrel of, of, of medical care. And it was for sort of those people who couldn't do other things. Nothing could be further than from the truth Not in, in, in contemporary wound care and world-class wound care. People like Dr. Cole, people like our esteemed colleague, Dr. Dr. Mark Moline, who's a board-certified vascular surgeon, trained at the Mayo Clinic, working at the Mayo Clinic. Brilliant people are involved in this field because these are really, really hard problems that require the best of the best. So thank you so much for the incredible work you're doing, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for the invite. This has been great. I really appreciate it. Good conversation. Yeah, for sure. Paul, would you like to lead us out? Absolutely. Another terrific show. We want to thank uh, Dr. Cole and the panel. This has been LymphCast, episode 47. And remember to check out our website early and often. I would say go there every day. There's always something new going on. That's lymphcastnetwork.com. Every show is on YouTube. Every show is on podcast land. Wherever you go, you will find this show. And again, that website, lymphcastnetwork.com. Before we bid you farewell, let's go around the table and thank our panel tonight. Uh, Dr. Chuback, would you take the honors uh, to officially thank uh, Dr. Cole for being here tonight? Dr. Wendy Cole, thank you once again for being with us. It's you know we've been in contact indirectly, but it's a it's a great pleasure to meet you personally, virtually here through Zoom, and uh, to see you and to speak with you. Your reputation preceded you, and of course, you not only lived up to it, but you exceeded it. I hope to work with you in the future, be in in close contact, and we have an open invitation for you on our program anytime. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. I'll take you up on that offer. Thank you so much. (laughs) All right. We want to thank our regular panelist. We couldn't see her tonight, but we could certainly hear her from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Dr. Eicher, thank you for everything tonight. 
Thank you, wonderful theme. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Cole, for sharing your expertise with us and with the listeners. I hope to see you again sometimes in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman who started this show, he's also the owner and founder of Vita Support MD. They make Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. Physician, surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Thank you, Dr. Chuback, for everything. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you at the next show. Keep listening and keep um, sharing the program with people you think it might impact and those it can help. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And again, this has been LymphCast episode 47. Have a great night. We'll see you next time for LymphCast episode 48. Have a great night.